Well, hello, everybody. So today we're going to talk about decoding the monitoring boards. Uh, some people call them trays, uh, some people boards. Uh, it doesn't matter what the name is. It's basically um, something that you can slide out of the bottom of the hive and um, where the debris falls. So I'm going to start my presentation because the next slide will show you what it is if you don't use one of those. Um, so it's a removable tray, right, that slides in and out of the bottom board of a hive or the debris from the hive falls, right? And so you can, uh, and the debris can give you clues to what is going on in the hive. Now I underline clues because it, it, it doesn't tell you everything that's going on in the hive, but it can give you, like it says, some indication, some clues about what is going on without opening the hive or before you open the hive. Um, so it's uh, the bottom boards or the, <clears throat> the monitoring boards are part of a screen bottom board system. And uh, the debris will fall through the, the screen onto uh, this board, this white board. Um, and there are different there are different types, right? We have the the beginning kits. They're inexpensive, they, they, but they're open on front of the back, and they're um, they're very little space between the board and the piece of wood where you slide it out of. And often you scrape everything off, and so it's hard to see what's going on when all the debris has been scraped off. And then you have a lot of um, <clears throat> homemade systems that people make themselves and uh, they could be closed where you you have a little piece of wood and uh, there's no way that the bees can go in and out and travel in there uh, but if you're not careful they could also not have the space necessary for the debris uh, when you pull it out and um, and then so the space can vary when people make it make their own so if you're going to make your own bottom boards and you want to have this this system uh, to read the, the debris, make sure you have enough space between the screen and the, the board so that when you pull it out, you can see all the debris. Uh, for a long time, I was purchasing the country rubes uh, because they had that's there was the only one on the market that did have extra space between the screen and the board. I was just told uh, that they don't make them anymore. So I'm, I'm sad, but we have, um, someone in our organization who is, is now making some, um, according to Serge Labesse, which was our great mentor here in Sonoma County. Uh, and um, so he's making them in his garage and selling them. So um, if anybody's interested, let me know and I can give you the, uh, the information on how to contact him. Um, and then here's a, a country route. I just want to point out <clears throat> a lot of us have um, modified our bottom boards to also be uh, with sliding doors, which makes it very easy to control the entrance and the traffic uh, alongside with um, a mouse guard. So types of monitoring board, you have different types. You have the floppy ones with the grid sometimes. Uh, they're made to count varroa mites. But when you have a lot of debris like that, it's really hard to see the grid. Uh, a lot of people are making them with political corrugated signs. Uh, they just uh, collect them after uh, they're done and uh, they cut them to size and they, they work really beautifully if you um, want something very inexpensive. And then there's a more stiff plastic um, <clears throat> that um, uh, are pretty durable. And, um, and I, th those are my preferred ones. I know that Rob has some metal ones, which he really swears by because he can also uh, torch them once they're done and sort of disinfect them um, if there's been any disease that fell through, any bits and disease care of the monitoring boards to clean them. Uh, I use a pastry scraper. It works really well. Uh, the metal ones works better than the plastic one uh, because it really takes the propolis pieces off if they have dripped onto it. And they're wide and flat and they do a really good job. Um, spraying or painting boards with oil. So you can buy sticky boards, which uh, you just peel off a, a little piece of paper and then they're sticky, but you can make your own with just painting some um, oil or sp you know, spray some olive oil on it. Uh, 
That way the Verroa gets stuck or the hive beetles get stuck to it. They can't climb back up. Uh, it makes the board easier to clean. And like I said, it mimics the commercial sticky boards. And then the, one of the problems that can happen with, with the boards, uh, with the monitoring boards is that they can warp. The, the floppy ones tend to warp more readily than the stiff one, but because of heat fluctuation, um, even the stiff one will, um, will sort of uh, warp. So you can either bend them backwards gently or flip them around the stiffer ones, or sometimes you have to replace them when they get to the point where they're so warped that they end up touching the screen and then the debris goes through the screen back up into the hive rather than staying away from the hive. So one of the things you can tell when you look, when you pull out your monitoring board is the size of the colony, right? So you have a smaller colony on the left, you know, maybe three frames of brood here um, or a medium sized colony. Notice how this one has it's more in the center. There's not a lot in the front and the back. So, you know, keep that in mind when you're looking at size of the colony uh, also. So this, the brood is nicely in the center here. And then you have really larger, um, <clears throat> um, a larger brood nest right here. You can almost count almost eight lines. And then very, very large and very busy hive will be just um, full, full of lines of debris, right? So you can tell the difference of what your hive is doing. And you can tell your hive from one time to the next, is it growing, is it shrinking, if you're taking really good notes, right? So look at your previous notes, or when did you clean it last, right? And then also what time of year is important? You know, is it a colony that's just coming out of winter? Is it a swarm that's just starting out? Is it a, a hive that is taking a break in the brood cycle because it's requeening? So it'll change whatever the debris is and the size of the, col the, size of the colony, depending what's going on inside the hive. Smell, I wanna sort of bring the other senses into beekeeping. Um, I use my sense of smell all the time. I'm always smelling, <laughs> smelling the comb, smelling the hive, smelling the entrance, <laughs> smelling when I open it. But also it, I'm aware of the smell when I pull out the board um, because it's not supposed to smell bad. And a foul odor can indicate a problem such as AFB or EFB or decaying bees. You could have a cheesy smell or mice urine if mice have gotten into your hive. And off smells sort of warrant an investigation. There are some, um, some nectar sources that are very poignant and smelly. So if you're aware of those, in your area, so you, you know, don't panic because you can, you know, it's probably that's what's going on. They're bringing in sort of stinky nectar. Uh, but usually when you just have something that doesn't smell nice, you know, there can be a problem. So that would be sort of a clue to look into your hive. What is going on into my hive, right? So familiarize yourself with what does a healthy hive smell like, all right? Moisture. So I get a lot of calls about, panic calls about there's mold on my monitoring board. Um, some of it can be um, normal. Like this hive, the first picture, the moisture is in the front of the hive, a little bit moldy. So possibly some rain or the wind or, or fog enters the entrance. So this hive, I would probably tilt forward a little bit so the moisture can run out. Right. Sometimes you can see puddles of little water in the middle and a lot of sort of moldy um, <clears throat> uh, uh, bee bread all around. And so hives like that, I'm, you know, I, I get a little bit more concerned whether their location is in too moist of, uh, uh, in too moist of an area. Right, so I may investigate what's going on with location. Is it too much in the shade? Um, if it's continuously moldy like that, there may be, it's maybe time to move the hive into a sunnier, sunnier location. And then you can have really larger puddles and really wet, uh, more in the center 
That could also be when the bees are um, uh, processing a lot of nectar and they're vacating the moisture of the, of the nectar coming in to then seal it into honey. The nectar is about 80% water when it's coming in and they need to dehydrate it to 17, 18%. So a lot of water may just fall down. But when I see larger amount of water on my monitoring board, I make sure that the, my hive is able to, um, <clears throat> to vacate that moisture correctly so that uh, when I open the hive, there isn't moldy frames, right? There may be some moisture on the side because of the way they circulate the air. They do this convection air circulation. So the outside of the hives may be a little bit more moist, but the center of the hive where the brood nest is needs to be dry. And if it isn't, then you have to mitigate that. So sometimes it's adding extra ventilation by popping the inner cover a little bit or opening the entrance a little bit more and, and things like that. The other thing is to look for is, is your equipment in good standing order or is a sprinkler hitting your hive at night and it's entering into the hive somehow. I had that situation once. I couldn't understand why everything was so wet in, in the hive to realize that I had a faulty <clears throat> emitter. And then also very, very large puddles like that. You know, you have to sort of say, okay, what is that? What's going on here? Um, you know, you could have a super, super strong nectar flow and they're really working on a lot of nectar dehydrating, but um, also just look into inside the hive and see is everything in order? Is, is the brood nest dry or what is going on in this hive? Scattered debris versus nice lines. So sometimes you'll see this beautiful nice lines. The, the, the debris is falling between the frames. And then sometimes it's more like scattered like this, like the other picture. And, you know, it's just sort of scant, right? So what is going on? So these are the question to ask. Is this a new colony that's just cleaning some comb? Are your frame misaligned? So your frame from one super to the next should be aligned on top of each other so that the debris that falls, falls all the way down. So it's much, you know, it sort of helps the bees not having to carry the trash from one super to the next all the way down. It just falls all the way through. Okay. Is the hive requeening or is there a break in the brood cycle where they're not raising a lot of, um, of brood and so there isn't a lot of debris? Or is the hive completely disorganized? It's queenless. What is going on with this hive, right? Or is it wind movement? Sometimes if people have open system where, where the monitoring board doesn't have a slat in front and the back to close it, the wind can come through and just sort of disperse disperse the debris all right so you know keep in mind what kind of system you have and then um or does the debris scrape off when you pull out this and slide it out every time and then you just don't have the full view of your debris right and then sometimes the debris is also displaced by wax moth and i have a picture of that in the in the later slide uh worker dust I call it worker dust. It's my own vocabulary because there's nothing in the literature to describe uh, some of this debris. And I called it worker dust because it looks like, like sawdust. So I just decided to call it worker dust. And that is the worker bees emerging. They have to let themselves out um, by chewing in a circle, by little bits by bits, their cappings and they birth themselves. And then it falls all the way to the ground or to the monitoring board. And the color will vary. If you can see the colors in these three slides vary because it depends if it's new comb or older comb or even older recycled comb. So in the spring, you're much more likely to see really light comb because they're building new comb. They're raising a lot of brood in new comb. And as the season goes, goes by, then you get a little bit darker comb because they're reusing the comb. Uh, the bees actually um, spin a cocoon once, right before they start pupation as the larva is sealed. And some of that cocoon stays behind and darkens the comb. The comb. And also they put a little layer of propolis in there. And so the comb gets darker and darker and darker. And so the older comb will have 
it will turn almost you know brown to black at the very end. Uh, a colony off center is something we look for, especially in the in the winter, because uh, if the colony is off center, it may run uh, to the side of the hive instead of going up where the honey is and lose contact with the honey. And so when you look at this in the winter, you may want to take a really quick look if you can, depending where you live, and recenter that colony and put the empty frame from one side and put it on the other so that's nicely again into the center of the colony. This colony right here actually um, died. And if you see all the bees, it, it actually clogged the entrance, fortunately. So um, I wish I would have seen that problem earlier. Uh, drone cappings are drones emerging and they look like completely little circles, circular, they're larger flakes, right? Very round. And the worker bees actually let the, let the drones out. They go around and cut like a can, a can opener all the way around and the wax capping falls off and whatever remains is just the cocoon capping and then the, the drones are let out. And this is sort of really uh, interesting um, um, thing to look for first thing in spring uh, before you even open your colonies because th about three weeks after you start seeing these um, drone flakes, it's swarm season, right? It just gives you that clue that the bees are now raising their male bees and uh, it takes another two, three weeks for them to mature and eat some honey and before they go flying on, uh, out to their congregation area. So the, when I first see that happening in my, in my apiary, I'm like, I count three weeks and sure enough, we start getting our first uh, swarm calls during that time, right? So the other thing to think about, is it normal or is it a, a drone laying queen or laying workers? So of course, time of year is very important to look at. In spring, you're gonna have a lot more drone cappings than you do in summer and fall, at least where, at least where we are. Um, but uh, you, know, you know that there's a lot of drones in there, but you still, when you do your hive inspection, say, is this normal drones or is it uh, from a colony that is uh, failing due to having a drone laying queen or laying workers? Um, so, um, <clears throat> and the time of year, of course, is important because if you see this in the fall, you probably know that this is uh, right before winter that you may have a problem. There are a few colonies that do raise drones year round, but not to this extent, usually. Pollen. When you see these little pollen sacs that the bees have dropped while they were trying to dislodge them into the cell, uh, you can see the different colors, which is really wonderful because that's good nutrition, right? Not all pollen is being, um, is, is made the same. You know, they complement each other in nutrition. So the more colors you have, the better it is for the bees. They have access to more vitamins, different lipids, different um, nutrition. Um, and uh, I'm gonna point out this really gray pollen here. Here in Sonoma County, uh, when we start seeing this gray pollen, which is our blackberry flow, that is our last big flow of the year before summer dearth hits. So that gives us a clue that um, that that's it's nearing the end of our nectar flow. Some of our colonies that don't have any food, uh, at least where I am, by the end of the blackberry, they they have some and they have enough to sort of make it, make them go through the summer dearth into fall. Um, sometimes there's this beautiful purple. Uh, pollen and we, we are all dying to know what what the, those flower sources are because it's just so pretty um, and I haven't really it's harder to find because it's, it's a little bit more unusual and um, and also the status of the hive when they're bringing in this amount of pollen they're raising something then protein need for the young nurse bees is high 
And so you know that they're raising something, but you still don't know what they're raising. So you still could have a drone laying a queen who needs to, um, who is, who is laying and, and there's drone larvae in there that need to be fed. So, you know, don't always jump to conclusion that everything is okay, but most likely when you see lots of pollen, lots of different colors like that, uh, things are, are on the right path. Wax flakes. These are these small little oval uh, glass-like flakes or little scales, uh, as you see right here on the left, picture on the left. Sometimes they're so transparent, they're hard to see. And on white, on white, it's almost impossible. You have to sort of, uh, you know, get the sun shining on your board the, the right way to see them glistening, right? And wax production is directly correlated to spring nectar flow um, in your area, right? Of course, if you're feeding sugar water, if you're feeding, it stimulates a nectar flow and you can stimulate wax production. But if you're not, it just shows you that your bees are in a nectar flow and they're actually building. And so you probably, probably want to be ready with an extra super or extra frames um, to add to your colony if they're starting to, to build in large amounts, right? It also shows that you have a good population and that you have young nurse bees that are present, right? It takes young bees to build comb. And so, um, and they also need to be well fed a lot. It takes a lot of nectar. I think the, the, the stats that uh, go up, that are going around the internet, it's eight pounds of honey for one pound of wax. And it's honey, not nectar. So, and if you remember that uh, nectar is 80% water and honey is dehydrated to 17, 18%, you can imagine the amount of nectar that needs to come in for comb building to happen. So not only do they have to feed their colony, uh, they also have to have that extra food for these bees, for these young nurse bees to start exuding the wax. Propolis. Um, it's mostly not really seen on monitoring boards, but on, on occasion, I get these inqu inquiries of what, the, what is this going on? And um, mostly you see big wads of propolis when, uh, because of heat, when it gets so hot that the propolis actually melts down the hive. And the picture here on the left was one of my hive when we had hit that 108 degrees that one summer. And, um, I didn't realize how the sun hit the back of my hives uh, around three and four o'clock when the sun was low and I live on a hill. And when I noticed this, I immediately got into action and I started to put plywoods in the back of my hive to sort of shield the sun in the late afternoon um, because that's way too hot. If the propolis is melting in your hive and falling on your follower board, your hive is way too hot and the bees have to work super hard to keep it cool. Um, the picture in the, in the center was the same situation, was little stalagmites melting propolis throughout the hive. So add shade to your hive, add, you know, an umbrella or a piece of plywood on top or to the back, depending where the sun hits. Um, I got this picture from a beekeeper and I didn't know, I had no idea what that looked like until he brought it into a meeting when we were having meetings. And we just by pinching it and, and touching it and smelling it, it was like, oh, that's propolis. So um, when you see this amount of propolis on your monetary board, you have a heat problem and you need to mitigate that for, or help your bees to stay cooler. And then this little piece of propolis was just a little scraping from in between the frames. Sometimes they put propolis in between the frames and you can't really close up your um, frames anymore. And you take your hive tool and you scrape that off and it just fell on the, on the monitoring board. And just a little, uh, be uh, up on top here is what it, it looks like when they're bringing in propolis compared to pollen, which is matte colored. Propolis is super shiny. And you can see it actually in the hive coming in. And it's really fun to see them. Okay, crystallized sugar. It looks like a little bit of snow dusting. And um, it's often uh, you see it, uh, bees coming out of winter when they're starting to really grow and hitting uh, their honey stores. 
And uh, since they don't heat the whole hive in the winter, a lot of the honey uh, was kept pretty cold and has crystallized. And um, they're going through that honey and they can't eat the crystals. They'll suck out all the juice, all the, the, the nectar that's left. And then they just dump the, the crystals and it ends up on your monitoring board. If you take your finger and taste it, it tastes just like sugar, but it's sugar from flowers, right? So it's bleach white. And uh, if you, uh, the picture on the right is a magnification of it. And it just does look like little sugar crystals. So there's not much to do except um, clean your monitoring board because it will attract ants. They just love that sugar. Uh, exuviae. So this was really interesting uh, in that larvae cannot grow past their skin and they shed their skin at every molt. So they have to molt several times. The molts are called instars, right? So the first one is when egg melts into a larva and then almost every day they're shedding their skin. They're sort of like a snake. They can't grow past their skin. And you can see these little skin-like we call the exuviae on the monitoring board. Here's a magnification of what they look like. Um, if you have a little bit of a breeze, they'll they'll fly. They'll just uh, fly off with the wind. So so if you know, be careful when you take that out. And if there's a breeze and looking at it, if you want to see the exuviae, it's very very light. It's very thin skin. Right. There is actually a sixth instar when the bee emerges, emer emerges after pupating. And for a very long time, I didn't know what these little twirly things were. See the right here, right there, right there. I thought it was some sort of little creature that was, was just um, pupating in the debris and taking advantage of this wonderful debris. But then I found out through my through Serge Lebes, our wonderful mentor, that they're the exuvia of the antennas when they emerge from um, from uh, <clears throat> pupating right into into the world. So what that means uh, when you have exuvia um, is that um, let me go back quickly. This kind of exuvia means that you have you have larva inside the hive. And sure enough, if you look, if you have this fresh exuvia and you go into your hive, you will see some larva. And then here you will know that you have some bees emerging, right? So some nice ver little varroa pictures in there too and some pollen. And right here, maybe a drone capping. Pests, let's talk a little bit about pests like mice. So you will see, uh, often this happens in the fall and winter, when you pull your monitoring board out, you start seeing feces from mice and wood shavings because they're gnawing on your frames and bigger chunks of wax because they're starting to eat through your wax and a lot of debris and hair, um, <clears throat> debris from their nesting materials. Um, if you look at the picture at the bottom, and you look at this little chewed area on this uh, entrance reducer, that all it takes for a little mouse to enter your hive. That is why at the very beginning, I sort of showed you the, the mice, um, the little mice um, <clears throat> excluder <laughs> in some ways, you know, mice guard that we've made out of, uh, of wire. Um, so it doesn't take much, even if you think they can't enter the small little opening they can chew through your um, through your entrance reducers. So mice guards are a good idea, especially if you live a little bit in the country. Um, mice will like a nice warm place for winter and they will enter and do quite a mess in there. And it just stinks to high heaven. Poops, all sorts of different poops on the monitoring board. Uh, it's insect poop is actually called frass, right? Um, so the long sort of squarish poops like that is wax moth. So don't panic if you see that because it doesn't necessarily mean there's wax moth up into your hive. The interesting thing about wax moth is that they enter your hive every night and they mask their pheromones and they go around in every cracks that they can find, they will lay some eggs and every day the bees have to remove them. 
And bees now have evolved to be able to deal with it. They'll recognize what they are, they'll throw the larva out, they'll throw the eggs out, and often they end up on your monitoring board where sometimes they hatch or the larva will continue eating the debris. And, and I have a picture later on that'll show you what it looks like once they, they start um, tunneling and, and pupating. Um, so actually that's where you actually want your, your wax moth. You want them thrown out of the, of the hive into the trash. But if you, but I will make a mental note if there's a lot of it to look into my hive in case my hive has become too small and the bees cannot patrol the entire hive and I maybe need to reduce my hive, reduce the space so that bees can manage their space. So that's a clue, right? So I hope you start seeing that all these little things can give you clues to what to look for when you go into your hive. Right, so you, that's one thing you may be looking at is space. How are the bees managing their space? In the center here is, um, it just looks like mini poppy seed fracas, and it is frass. It is um, earwigs. Actually, you actually see a little dead earwig here. When I see this, I know that the, the, that the hive is in either too much shade or in a too damp area, because that's what attracts earwigs. If I open the, the outer cover and between the outer cover and inner, inner cover is full of earwicks, I know that's a nice, warm, moist area and, the, and they're just loving it. They usually don't do anything inside the hive. They just live on the periphery. Uh, but uh, for me, it's just a clue and an indication that maybe this colony needs to move more into the sun. Um, and again, the we've talked about mice poops right here and then on the very top the right corner picture is a dysentery right bee dysentery um, which is basically diarrhea and they look like flat drop like yellow brown spots and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit uh, varroa mites right is something that you can see on your monitoring board the picture on the left is really i mean this is I don't like to see this many mites. Um, I do know that some bee colonies can survive with quite a load of mites. But uh, when I see an enormous amount of mite like that, I'm going straight to the brood nest and I'm looking to see how the bees are managing their mite load. Are they able to clean out? Are they using hygienic behavior? Or am I seeing melted larva? I'm, I'm seeing bees half emerge with their tongues out. I see parasitic mite syndrome um, happening. Uh, then I will uh, either requeen the colony. I might, if it's really, really bad, I might euthanize the colony. Um, I am treatment free, but I'm not a laissez-faire beekeeper. I am on my colonies. And uh, I, I do, um, interfere when I see mites to that level, right? But not all, you know, not when I see only a few and, um, you know, but I do always look when I see mites on my monitoring board, I go look in my brood nest and I make sure that the bees can handle and manage them, right? So because there's variation in hygienic behavior, which is genetic, also time of year, we all know that sometimes they ramp up in the late summer and fall. Um, the stage of the colony, right? Sometimes uh, if you do a split or uh, a swarm and they have not raising brood, all the bees are, uh, all the mites are phoretic and they're, cl they're, they're cleaning and grooming a lot more. You may have a higher mite, mite drop than if you have brood in there and the mite can reproduce and, and things like that. So, you know, what stage of your colony is can matter in the amount of mites that you find on the monitoring board. Also the size of the colony, right? We all know the bigger the colony, the more opportunity for mites uh, the, uh, to reproduce are. And I'm starting to keeping my colony a lot smaller. I used to go up to six, seven supers. I don't do that anymore. I will split more readily and keep smaller colonies. They seem to be able to manage the mites better. And then some people use the monitoring board to do a 24 hour mite drop as a monitoring system and, um, and decide 
when to treat or not to treat according to that. Um, they may decide, okay, it's time to do um, a sugar or a, um, uh, what's the other system to test the mites. And so um, they may look at their monitoring board to see what their, their drop is there and then um, act accordingly. Uh, pollen mites. So this is something uh, not many people know about that there's this little opportunistic mite that loves to eat bee bread. And uh, I'm not going to um, pretend I know how to pronounce <laughs> the name, so I'll let you read it. But uh, it's relatively common species of, hive, of mites in the hive. And on your monitoring board, it looks like a brown flower. It's very, very, very fine uh, debris. And uh, it's more common in late winter and early spring when the bees have abandoned the bottom of the brood nest and moved up into the honey store and left behind their, uh, their bee bread that is, was stored in the bottom of the hive. And since nobody's patrolling, nobody's mining the bottom of the hive, these little mites have a heyday and start eating the pollen and it all falls out. Uh, I don't think it's any de to detriment to the to the bees, you, it may be a good time if you wanted to call some of the older comb that's at the bottom of the hive to take that bottom super off and replace it with fresh frames or wait till spring arrives when you're growing the colony up on top again. Um, that's a, maybe a good time to do that because most likely the colony is vacating the bottom super when you see that. Pests, wax, wax moth. We talked a little bit about the wax moth frass. Um, and like I told you, often the bees will just remove them from inside the hive and drop them through the screen and there they are. Uh, but they find themselves in this wonderful debris that they still feel is scrumptious and they continue munching on it and pupating and they make these little tunnels and then they end up um, pupating um, and making wax moth at the bottom. This is definitely a time when I clean my monitoring board when I really see this, um, the, the, the pupa of the, of the wax moth. It's time to really give it a good cleaning. Um, I do th throw those to my chickens, which they also uh, love just like they love drone brood that we were talking about before the meeting started. Uh, ants. Are they a friend? Are they a foe? A lot of people look at them as, as pests, but a few ants on the monitoring board is okay. They clean up debris. They're like, they're like uh, the carrion of the insect world, right? They, they just remove dead debris. Um, the picture uh, on the left here is a piece of, the, of an abdomen of a bee. Picture in the next picture, an ant is carrying a varroa mite. Uh, up here, ant is carrying a leg of a bee. Um, over here, they're working in tandem to remove a wax moth, an adult wax moth, right? So they have their place into the world, but they can be a nuisance when they start living in your colony or your colony has become weak and they take advantage. The bees cannot manage warding off the, the, the ants and they start climbing. So when you start seeing a highway of ants going in like that, um, you have a problem. If you're feeding sugar syrup in the top feeder, that might be the issue, or they're just going up into the colony, helping themselves to the nectar and honey because the colony is crashing or it's dwindled or it's shrunk and it can't patrol the entire hive. So it's time to go in that colony and seeing, okay, what's going on in here? You know, What do I need to do to help the bees being able to manage the ants. Most often they can. Um, so a colony that has an ant problem usually has another problem. And so that's the clue for me. What is going on with that colony? Um, hive beetles. Um, if you see little larvae that sort of look like wax melt larvae, but they're a little bit more pinkish and they're a little bit more spiky and they have their head looks a little bit more like mandibles of a beetle than you and have and there is no webbing 
um, then most likely those are hive beetle um, uh, larvae. And the same thing, the, sometimes the um, <clears throat> hive beetles have been thrown out of the hive or chased down through the, through the screen into the monitoring boards and they've laid eggs in there and or the bees have thrown out the eggs and they continue pupating in the debris because the debris is good enough for them to continue growing and going through um, their life cycle. Um, sometimes you, you will see live beetles and sometimes you will see dead beetles. Um, so I always note that because um, I want to know uh, if the first of all if the bees are handling the the beetles by themselves or if I'm starting to have a problem. So I also look inside the hive. Um, I use wooden feeder boxes not to feed my bees but to as I put the lavender in there as wicking um, for uh, moisture control because uh, I live in a in more of a semi-coastal uh, and we have a lot of humidity. And so I'm always also looking in that feeder box to see if the bees have chased the, the beetles in there. And then I also look in the hive. Do I have a lot of beetles running around? Do I see them with my eyes in the brood nest and the bees not minding them? So I also can tell if the bees are have the trait to deal with them or not. Inside the hive, you will see the, the hive beetles um, in multitude, there tend to be a lot more of them than wax moth. And unfortunately, their excrements um, ruins the honey. Um, they have a substance in there that just makes the honey uh, ferment. And then it becomes inedible for human and bees alike. So you don't really want to have uh, a beetle problem. Fortunately, until now, here in Sonoma County, it's still a minor pest. It's growing in the outskirts um, of uh, counties around us, have a much larger problem, but mostly still the bees, uh, unless the comb has collapsed or the bees cannot patrol um, adequately the comb, then you start having a real um, bee, uh, 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 beetle problem. The other problem is also if, how you store your comb. And we'll sh I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, the sap beetle, which is also um, a type of hive beetle, it's skinnier and longer. We used to see it a lot more. Uh, recently, I'm seeing it a lot less. Maybe it's being outcompeted by the, the hive beetle. It just comes from a different country. The hive beetle is, comes from Sub-Saharan Africa. It was probably imported through some fruit on some cargo and the uh, uh, sap beetle was uh, imported from Australia when they opened the borders again, when they didn't have enough bees for almond pollination. And they, um, they made sure that they were disease free, they did a risk assessment, but unfortunately they did not look at the beetles and uh, guess what came over with those packages is, um, with those bees is a new kind of beetle, a pest. And it's the same thing as the hive beetle, you know, it can be a minor or major pest. Mostly, at least here, it's been a minor pest. And like I said, for some reason, we're seeing it, I'm seeing it a lot less. Same thing, it's got these little paddle antenna. Both of these beetles have little paddles antenna like that, so, which is pretty indicative that they're either one of the other um, uh, hive beetle. Uh, on the left here is, um, some honeycomb I had left in a bin and just didn't get to it, didn't get to it. And I think it was three months into it, I finally opened it and this is the mess I found. And obviously there were beetle eggs in that comb and they had absolutely eaten all the honey. It has it had um, fermented and frothed and um, it destroyed probably 10 frames of honey. Very disappointing. So now if I know that I'm not going to get to extract my honey right away, I freeze it for at least 48 hours, which usually kills the, the beetle larva and, um, and eggs, as well as, as wax moth, if there's any wax moth eggs still left in there. Um, so here's a little bit more clearer picture of a beetle larva versus a wax moth larva. 
The beetle is much more, has these little spikes on top, much more spiky, a little bit different color. Um, if you look at their tiny little heads, looks like a beetle, uh, mandibles, right? Here's an adult hive beetles, here's an adult sap beetle, and then the greater wax moth and the lesser wax moth. We have two different wax moths that enter our hives and one is just bigger than the other. I guess that's why they greater and lesser. <laughs> So initially when we were first seeing these little beetles, the, the sap beetles, we called them the lesser uh, hive beetles because we didn't know they were sap beetles. We didn't know what they're coming from. And then um, we came out that there were those little sap beetles from, from Australia. Um, hygienic behavior, decapping and removing sick uh, or parasitized pupa can be seen on the monitoring board. So do you remember these bigger flakes that were super round like this right here, super round? Those are drone cappings, right? Drones emerging. But look at this one, it's jagged edged. This one looked like it was pierced initially. It was, uh, um, uh, a bee had noticed that there was something wrong with this pupa and pierced a hole in it. And then another bee may come and remove it, right? Sort of gives them the clue that this bee is ready to be euthanized and thrown out, right? And so you see these larger flakes that are a little bit jagged edged like this. So when I see that, I know that the bees are removing pupa. So what I'm looking for inside the hive when I look at that is how are they keeping up with whatever is ailing them? You know, whether it's varroa or some other disease that they need to remove the pupa for. And you can see on this, um, on the on the left, pieces of actual pupa that they've removed, right? Here's one piece, or here's a dried up piece of maybe a scale. There's all these pieces of things that they have removed, right? So they're going through something inside the hive and they're trying to mitigate it and stay on top of it. And I, as a beekeeper, want to know if they're doing a good job and if they can. And this might be a colony I will go in a little bit more frequently to make sure and follow them that they don't uh, uh, start crashing. Or like Rob Keller tells me, he's circling the drain. You can see them, you can watch them just go decrease in size and just not being able to manage with, the, with what's going on. And then you as a beekeeper need to interfere. Right, whether it's requeening, whether it's to reduce the hive, whether it's to split the hive, whatever it is that you need to do. Um, disease and parasites, right? So here we have dried up little brown scales. We just saw this uh, coming out of winter in an entire apiary had EFB and the bees were trying to um, to remove all these, uh, these larvae that had dried up that were consumed by the bacteria of EFB, of European fowl brood. And it stank like, it, like some rotten cheese. It was just really distinctive smell, right? The other thing it could be early in the spring is chill brood. When the colony really grows really rapidly and at nighttime it gets really cold and they need to, to cluster really tight and they abandon the outskirts of the nest. They just don't have enough bees to cover it. Cover it. And the queen was just too overly enthusiastic in her laying, uh, her laying eggs. And <clears throat> when the brood emerged, it just couldn't cover it at night. And so sometimes we have, you know, dead larva, dried up larva that they throw out like that. So, you know, time of year would be important. Both EFB would and chill brood are beginning of the season usually, or maybe it's a virus too. It could be a viral infection of some kind, right? And then in the center, you can see pieces of uh, pupa as well. And you can also see there's a lot of varroa mites here. So are the bees probably trying to mitigate the, the varroa in this hive? And then again, here you can see another really big pieces of, of, of pupa removed, right? And that scale again, that's jagged edged versus the really round one of the drone being emerging. Um, disease, chalk brood, it's a fungal disease. Um, we get it here where I am in Petaluma because we're semi-coastal, we tend, we tend to have a little bit higher cases than other places that are warmer and drier. Um, it looks like little pieces of chalk, 
and they could be white or they could be black. It's just that once the, the pupa, the prepupa is consumed, um, uh, the fruiting body of the fungus then turns, makes the, the fungus look black. And they would look like little chunks like this on the monitoring board. You can see little pieces that the bees have removed. You will also see them at the entrance of your hive or in front of your hive. And uh, right on here, you can see here's one, here's one, there's little pieces of chalk brood, right? Um, they look like little mummies. You can see where the head of the prepupa is. So it is, it, the fungus is fed to the larva and then it is sealed. And then once the, the, the larva, the prepupa is sealed, that's when the fungus attacks. So it's, it's right underneath the, the capping. So the bees have to decap it to take them out. So that's also a hygienic behavior. They have to sense, uh, sense that, the, that the pupa is, um, is, uh, is affected by, by the fungal disease. Um, it's most likely a genetic, uh, there's a genetic component to it. Uh, when you read the literature, it says just add ventilation. It doesn't work. I've tried everything. Um, Requeening is one of the things uh, that's the best thing you can do for a chalkbrood colony. Uh, also reducing it in size, keeping it tight, making sure that the bees cover every frame so that they can do their hygienic behavior and keep it clean. Um, it doesn't always kill a colony. I've had uh, colonies struggle with um, chalk brood and survive pretty well and even give me extra honey, which sometimes baffles me, but <laughs> they can. Um, it could also have some sort of environmental stresses when we look at fungicides and how it may affect uh, bee biomes and things like that. So there hasn't been really good correlation with that, with, uh, with a chalk brood, but living uh, in uh, <clears throat> in agricultural um, county um, where there's a lot of vineyards and an awful lot of fungicide spraying, sometimes I wonder if there's a real real correlation with that as well. Um, so that we are weakening the bees um, biome so they can't deal with um, with uh, with fungus. We're killing the good fungus inside in their biomes. Uh, discarded old bee bread. Uh, I get pictures all the time, people thinking it is chalk brood, but really what is happening is that bees are moving back into abandoned comb in the spring and uh, out with the old so that they can bring new in. Bee bread is a live product. Uh, bees uh, will add enzymes to the bee bread and it's a fermented live product. It needs to be tended. If it isn't, it dries up and it, it, it's dead and there's no nutritional values to the bees. So uh, old bee bread they throw out so that they can clean those cells and bring in new or use that area to, for brood rearing again. You can tell it has layers. You know, it doesn't have that little head on top, the little shape of the head like the, the chalk brood had. Um, and um, they can be, usually they're sort of brownish, grayish, whitish looking. Yeah, it's just, um, just completely dried out and the color has, has sort of disintegrated. Um, dysentery, again, we talked a little bit about that. I just wanna bring it up again because there's different things that can cause dysentery. Uh, if uh, in dry, drought times, bees will um, uh, collect honeydew, which is the secretion of aphids because they look, they're desperate for anything sweet. And that is something that's very sweet. The ants also collect it. Um, and so they store it and, um, but they can't, when they get to eat it later, they cannot digest it very well and it can cause um, some dysentery. Uh, Nosema apis, one of the Nosema, which is a, a microsporidian, uh, which attacks the lining of the, of the stomach <clears throat> of the bees. Um, will also give dysentery. Although we don't see as much of the Nosema apis um, than Nosema serenae, which is sort of the new Nosema, which has sort of displaced the Nosema apis. And unfortunately, the Nosema serenae does not have symptoms. At least this Nosema, we, we could tell, okay, maybe, you know, we have that disease, but um, now it's sort of like, uh, um, you know, there's some silent nosema out there that we don't know happened. Colony would just start dwindling 
over time and you don't you you'll never know unless you crush the bees and look at them under a microscope that you have a problem um, fermented sugar so if you're feeding sugar and the bees are not eating it and it's staying into your feeder or your bottle <clears throat> that you're using or jar um, and it ferments and the bees eventually eat it, it could give them dysentery. The picture below was a hive I went into where someone had branches of something to uh, put in there so the bees wouldn't drown. He had put sugar water in it, in that top feeder and thought it was all good and didn't go into his colonies for a few weeks. And uh, when we opened it, well, it was a gooey mess of fermented yuck in there. And the picture on the right is what it looked like and the monitoring board uh, is what it looked like. So you could have easily said, oh, that's nosema, 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 but no, you know, when you look at the conditions of that yucky stuff that the bees were feeding on, um, you could probably pretty much say, you know what, that is their food source is, is really bad. So we took everything out and cleaned everything out and it, it, um, it went away. So that's another clue, right? Um, so dysentery on the frames would look like big blotches of yuck, right? Um, so the other thing that um, can cause dysentery is very, very small colonies that cannot thermoregulate anymore. And they get the runs, sort of like they get the flu, right? They just can't they can't digest normally anymore because their temperatures are just completely off. They get too small. Uh, dead bees on the monitoring board, we'll get a lot of inquiries about that. Um, there shouldn't be dead bees. Uh, they should not actually have access, if possible, to your monitoring board because you don't, the bees in the bee tree do not walk through their trash. So why should we have our bees walk through their trash? So um, all my systems are a way so they can't get in, but every once in a while it still happens. Um, and um, so I look at what I try to investigate. What is it? Some of these monitoring boards have a slot, either a circle or a long slot. So you can pull, put a, like a string or something so you can pull an app out. If they're too big, the bees can go through. So I, here I saw bees stuck in between. For some reason, they were coming in through in here and, um, and then not able to come out. They would die on the monitoring board. This colony on the right was consistently with tons and tons of dead bees. I was frustrated. I couldn't figure out how they got in. And finally, I decided to switch out the bottom board. And I really looked at it uh, inch by inch. And I found there was a defect in the screen. And the bees were able to go in and they couldn't come back out. It was like a trap. And that solved the problem. So, you know, if you see a lot of dead bees on your board, then it's, it's your responsibility to say, okay, what, what, where's the defect? What's going on? How can I change that? You should not have dead bees on your monitoring board. And here's a picture of a bee. Uh, amazingly, all the, varro the live varroa were climbing onto her. So it just shows you that the bees, that the varroa will find, if the bees have access to your monitoring board or the trash, they will jump back onto the bees if they're alive. Uh, robbing, so a hive under siege, you will see lots and lots of legs and wings and body parts. Um, other bee colonies will rob bees or other colonies and also um, yellow jackets will rob bees. And the bees will try to fight them off and sometimes they, they lose and um, they lose all their wings and legs and uh, battle through the battle. Right when you see large, large chunks of wax like this on the monitoring board, then you know you may have some robbing happening. Uh, at that point, the robbers have come into the colony and they're pillaging, they're ripping everything open, they're not very nice about it. It's mayhem in there, and they're not taking their sweet time, they're doing it fast. They're um, like I said, just ripping the bit, all the cells apart. Um, and you can see that by the, you know that they're, your robbers are pretty much winning when you see these big chunks of debris. Uh, newspaper, when you combine colonies 
and via the newspaper method where you put a piece of newspaper with slits in it and you combine two colonies together. It gives them time for the pheromones to mix together while they chew their way through the newspaper. And it will end up on the monitoring board as fluff, just all this fluff. So be ready for this very strange looking fluff on your um, monitoring board if you combine colonies. Uh, this was, I, I was scratching my head a little bit. It was like, well, this, what are these trends, this, this electric green little specks, you know, what's going on in my hive? And then I remembered that I was using bright colored uh, rubber bands to um, correct some wonky comb and the bees just chewed through them and then threw them out. And uh, so that was pretty funny, at least to me. <clears throat> uh, clean, empty monitoring boards without anything on it. You know, is that colony dead? Is it requeening and there's nothing going on? They're taking a break in the brood cycle. What's going on? Oh, you forgot you just cleaned it. Or you have a tiny, tiny, tiny little cluster like this, you know, maybe that colony is no more viable or it needs to really be shrunk to a few frames. Um, what is going on with this colony? That's just not, not normal to have such small debris, right? Is, is it a colony on its way out? And then we can stop here. I have a bunch of slides where we can just look at different monitoring board and what we see, or we can um, have questions right now. So I'll leave it up to you. I don't know how we're doing time-wise. I might be just a little over an hour. Yeah, um, let's, let's uh, thank you so much. That's so, uh, really engaging. You have excellent pictures. And um, we do have a few questions that um, we're all curious about. Um, we're guessing that you run mediums, is that right? Yes, uh, okay, yeah. should, I end, should I end sharing so I can see everybody? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that might be great, thank you. Let's see, where am I, just a second here. Mm, stop share, there we go. My back, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. So uh, do you run mediums for most of? Yes. yes. Mostly process? I run mediums and, but I'm also experimenting now with really long frames called what we call double deeps. They're the size of two deeps uh, length, uh, deep depth wise. So it's sticking two deep frames together um, with um, uh, reinforcements. So they're very long so that when you inspect your colony, you're only inspecting it vertically, you're not breaking it down vertically and horizontally. And the neat thing about that is you see, you see the whole brood nest, the organization of the whole brood nest on one frame. Um, so we're, I'm slowly, slowly switching to that, but it's been a slow process because I've had a lot of colonies on mediums. But um, I suggested the if, to either do all mediums or all deeps because it's so versatile. I can move frames up, I can move frames down, I can combine colonies. When it's all one side, it size, it makes it really, really easy. Good. How often are you doing um, bottom board inspections? So uh, every time before I inspect the hive, I look at the entrance first to see what's coming in, the demeanor of the bees, what's going on. And then I pull out the monitoring board before I go in. Or sometimes even in between my hive inspection, if I'm worried about, on a hive or I just wanna know what's going on, I will pull a monitoring board and I'm not disturbing the bees really. I'm just looking, or in the winter too. I can tell if a hive is, has died or crashed mm -hmm. in the winter and then without having to open it. Um, some folks have been told that uh, you only leave a monitoring board in for 48 hours when you're doing a check. Otherwise it'll interfere with their ventilation. What are your thoughts on that? So I leave mine in year round, but I, I am semi-coastal, maybe a little cooler than some people. Um, I do the ventilation through the entrance. So those sliding doors are great because I see the bees really ventilating, having a hard time. I open those doors, you know, or there's robbing, I close those doors, right? So I do the ventilation through the front entrance, not through the bottom. I also live in a very windy area. And if I leave the Monty port off, the wind just comes right under uh, into the hive and they have to mitigate that wind. I figured in the bee tree, there isn't, um, you know, it's not just a 
there is a bottom to it, <laughs> right? There is, uh, it's not open air at the bottom. So um, I'm also looking at that. I try to mimic as much as I can uh, what's going on in a bee tree into the mm -hmm. hive. Mm -hmm. I think you have us very excited about snapping photos of our bottom boards so that we can see exuviae of the antennae, which is a comment here from Denise, but I second that. Um, yeah. It was yeah, uh, great you, pictures. You, you, you get really excited when you see it the first time. You go, I know what that is. <laughs> yeah. It's great pictures. And, and so much knowledge to be had from just looking at your bottom board. Right. Yeah, it always sort of, I always, because as beekeepers, we, we do our hive inspection and we go and we go in blind, we don't know what we're going to look for. And I, and I find that with, especially with new beekeepers, they, they have no idea what they're looking at and looking for. So looking at the monitoring board can sort of guide you. Oh, okay, I'm going to look at the size of the colony. Do I need to grow? Do I need to shrink? Oh, oh, wow, look, there's, there's exuvia. I must have larva in there. I'm, I'm going to go look for larva, you know? So it gives you sort of uh, uh, a reason why to go into your body. It focuses you on yeah. some things. Yeah. We, we teach that regularly as part of our beekeeping, uh, at least here in Sonoma County. Um, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Start with uh, your monitoring board and ask yourself some questions about what you see and play the detective role from that perspective. Yeah. Christine, it is uh, 811 and I want to give our our friends here in, in the camp an opportunity to say goodbye if they wish. I'm going to officially thank you for your generosity of time, your knowledge, your insight, and your excellent presentation. Uh, really engaging, love the pictures. And um, thank you, thank you, thank yeah, you. You're welcome.